see a couple of you are blinking like, I'm sorry, did I wake you up? I did. <laughs> okay, no, really good to see you this morning. Hope everything is going well. Uh, hope that, uh, you know, as you're getting ready for things and uh, family events, uh, maybe you've been to a couple of parties, uh, you know, um, that uh, you are still like focused and thinking about what it means for Jesus to have come, that what it means for you and I to really focus ourselves, not just on a holiday or uh, the, all the, the cool trimmings or the fun that goes with that, not just the, the family events and all of that, but that you and I would really have our hearts focused this season in stopping to remember what Jesus actually did in coming. <clears throat> well, over the past two weeks, we've been talking specifically uh, in terms of Advent and, and the kingdom of God, classic Christmas texts making us aware of just how those texts really speak about the message of the kingdom and how it was so integral to Jesus' first coming, not just his second coming. Because our tendency in the way we read it through tradition is really just keep all the focus on the second coming. Um, and so we put, make him king and kingdom just of those things. And uh, today, our text likewise speaks to us about Jesus' first coming. And yet, like many other texts about Jesus having come, it's generally not associated in our minds or traditions with the kingdom of heaven. But furthermore, this particular text actually is often not talked about in terms of Advent. We like to use it as an evangelistic, evangelistic text. It's something that we're all very familiar with, and yet it really does speak to this whole thing of his first coming and about the kingdom come. Now, interesting enough, um, just like other texts which we get familiar with, sometimes we read in autopilot. Anybody ever do that? You just read in autopilot. In fact, one of the reasons that sometimes it's good to change up the translation you've been reading for years is just simply to read it with fresh eyes. To, it's not that the message is going to change. It's that it's going to make you stumble over words. You're going to get kind of physically uncomfortable in the process because you're used to just letting it flow and reading a particular version. And so by doing that, there's a, a, something that makes you stop and think. You have to actually process what the sentence says, and it will force you to do a little more critical thinking and not just read out of tradition or habit. And so those are really good things. Well, last week, <clears throat> the verse I mentioned in particular is our text today. It, I'm talking about John 3.16. And, you know, in that sense, the citation of this passage is really familiar to us. I mentioned last week that it's often uh, seen at sporting events because it's just such a quick, little easy thing to put up on a screen. Uh, somebody holding a card up and a crazy wig was what happened when I was a kid. Then later on, Tebow put it on, uh, you know, under his eyes uh, and it drew attention that way. Uh, it still continues to be something that is uh, used or, or uh, in uh, sporting events. Today, our media doesn't cover it as much as they have in other times past, but the reality is, is that when we think of John 3.16, the entire content of that prescription to most of us is just simply thinking about that the promise for God to save us. And because of that, <clears throat> we do really read it in a way that is very tradition, you know, bound. Uh, we, we read it or we, you know, reference it uh, solely in terms of someone uh, receiving Christ or something like that. Um, and beyond that, we really don't think a whole lot about the text. Truth is that many of us, even if we say we're familiar with it, if pressed, couldn't actually quote it verbatim, but here's the other part, certainly couldn't talk about what the context of the passage is. We would say, well, it's, it's about salvation, right? And the truth is, is um, uh, while it discusses the topic, uh, no, no, it's actually not talking about that in that moment. And so we're going to take a look at this context rooted in Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus about the kingdom of God 
and the nature of the kingdom and how one enters the kingdom, which is, does involve salvation, but is a much, much bigger context and concept than simply getting your ticket punched so that you don't go to hell. So even still, uh, why, one might ask, what does this have to do with Advent? Well, just let me think, get you to think for just a moment. Right there in verse 16 is Advent is the first coming, and it gives us the very reason for his first coming. Sounds like an Advent text to me. Anyhow, all right, let's take a look at this whole thing of love as it involves the king and the kingdom. With that in mind, uh, let's take a fresh look at this Christmas and kingdom text, starting in John chapter 3, verse 1. And uh, if you would, just follow along in whatever translation you have in your lap. Of course, that one's my favorite. I'm going to read from the ESV. Let's take a look. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, do not marvel at what I said to you, you must be born again. For the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you have no understanding of these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and we bear witness to what we have seen but you do not receive our testimony. I have told you of earthly things and you do not believe. How can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one who has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works would be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Blessed be the reading of God's holy word. <clears throat> so one of the first things I want you to give your attention to for just a moment is the point of why Nicodemus was coming. Nicodemus was coming because he wanted to understand what was going on. If you and I just kind of paraphrase for a moment, he doesn't actually come to him and say, how do I get saved? Because in the mind of Nicodemus, Nicodemus is saved. There's no question in the mind of Nicodemus that he's saved. He's the teacher of Israel. He's uh, of the chosen people. And, um, you know, a common misunderstanding uh, that has been ascribed by Christians to the Old Testament, but does not play out in the Old Testament or any other Jewish writings, is the idea that the Jews thought that if they didn't keep the law that they lost their salvation. That's not what they believed. 
They believed very clearly that they were chosen, and therefore having been chosen, that they were saved regardless as the keepers of the law. And when I say keepers of the law, I don't mean those who keep the law perfectly. I mean as those who possess the law. That's the understanding. Because we possess the law, and then the failure to keep the law oftentimes got them kicked out of the promised land, but always with the anticipation that they would be restored There was never the understanding that you do something wrong and that you're not going to go to heaven. That is a Christian understanding. That is not an Old Testament understanding of the law. Uh, And so specifically, uh, in the mind of Nicodemus, there would have, that, that question doesn't get asked. He doesn't ever ask the question, how do you get saved? Doesn't get asked. We read it in because we read the other things he says about eternal life and we conclude that must be what he was talking about. But keep in mind, not every time somebody asks Jesus something, do they get the same the answer that they were looking for. Hello? Do you ever go to the text and you're like reading and you're going like, wait a minute, that's not what he asked. Wait a minute, that's not what I was asking. Or you find something that fits you and you go, oh, I like this. It answers this over here. And then you realize, wait a minute, but if I read it in its context instead of just taking the verse the way I'd like to take it, it actually doesn't say what I want it to say. Anybody? Anybody? Just context? Maybe? Little? Okay. So, in this context, Nicodemus is wanting to understand what Jesus... He's, he's on a mission to find out what Jesus' mission is. And I'm going to paraphrase, but basically saying like this. Look, you're doing all this really cool stuff. Why? What... What is the motive for what you're doing? Why are you doing these things? And he's offering possible prescriptions because he's saying, well, let's see. Well, here's what I know. When I watch you do these things, when I see these things, when I see the evidence, this is what I do know. You must be from God. There's conclusion number one. That's what he's asking him. So if you're from God, like, what has God got you doing here? If you want to think in terms of the the context in his world right there, that the questions that are constantly being put to Jesus, and even by John the Baptist, uh, is the question of, like, should we look for you? Are you the the one, or should we look for someone else? And when they asked the the disciples of Jesus uh, who he was, uh, some of them said, well, do you think he's, do you think he's, John the Baptist come back from the dead? Do you think he's the Elijah? Do you think he's this? Do you think he's that? They're making references to all kinds of messianic tradition and history, and they're referring to all of these things, and he pierces through that uh, and begins to set them in a different direction from what their presumptions are about who Messiah is, what Messiah does, why he has come. And in this case, we have the teacher of Israel, and he's It's basically what he's asking. Are you, like, as I watch this happening, you must be somebody significant from God. It just seems like a fair conclusion. I know this part must be true. So now my next question is, is, like, why? Why are you doing these things? Are you the Messiah? Are you going to come and deliver us from the hand of Rome? Are you coming to set us free? What 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 are you coming to do? What is it your purpose in your coming? To which Jesus replies, and I'm paraphrasing, but listen, you can't see what I'm doing, nor understand where this is leading, nor can you enter into it because you're looking at everything with the wrong eyes. You have a carnal perspective. You're looking at everything through the lens of what you want to see happen. You're looking through the lens of the things that you understand about the the way things are. You're asking because there is no way from the point of view where you are that you could understand what my kingdom is about. You are with carnal eyes looking and you need spiritual eyes in order to comprehend what I'm about to say, or to join in. There's no way you can join in this thing. This new perspective is so far beyond some kind of simple shift in viewpoint. It's, It's so huge a change from earthly and carnal to godly and spiritual that he says, without a transformation 
a really radical transformation. You can't grab it. In fact, this transformation is so huge, it would be like being born again. Now, don't think, and when I say that, that I'm dismissing the idea of being born again. I'm certainly not saying that. I absolutely believe that we have to be born again. But I'm just simply saying, as he's saying that, that, that the context, this is fresh. They've never heard it before. It's not like you sitting in a church pew for, you know, 30 years, 20 years, 5 years, however long you've been sitting in, a, in the pew, and you get used to hearing things the same way all the time. Well, born again, oh, okay, that's, that's, immediate, we're talking about salvation. Oh, it's time to pray, time to get baptized, time to, you know. And we, like, have our list of things, and I, but I want you to hear it with the way that Nicodemus is hearing it for the first time. He's saying, look, I, I, I see you doing these things. What's the purpose? What's the point? Where, where, where's all this going? What has God sent you to do? And, and he tells him, I, I really can't tell you. You wouldn't understand. You ever seen like you driving behind a Jeep and they have that sticker? It's upside down and it says, it's a Jeep thing you wouldn't understand. Like in other words saying, well, unless you drive a Jeep and you're like me, you, you couldn't possibly comprehend. While you're li- really looking and thinking to yourself, well, I don't drive a Jeep, but I know this, that you're probably going to do something stupid and end upside down. That's, that's what I read. Now, if you own a Jeep, I'm not picking on you because it's fun, okay? Just don't. But I do think, every time I see that bumper sticker, I just, that's what I'm thinking to myself is, oh, well, I'm, I'm a little haughty and a little full of money. No, I'm, I'm kidding. But all right, I, really, you know, the idea is what Jesus is saying to him here is you won't get it. You cannot comprehend. Even though you are the teacher of Israel, you, you would have to have a complete change of perspective. Now, in that message, he is certainly, in being born again, he's certainly talking about salvation. He's certainly talking about <clears throat> a new kingdom life. There's no doubt about that. But as his answer to the question being asked, it's not the question that, G, that, that Nicodemus is asking. And Jesus' answer to Nicodemus was essentially, you're not equipped. You're not equipped to grab hold of this. Now, it didn't end right there. In fact, it, you know, Nicodemus continues to prod and basically says, look, this born again, like what you're talking about, that's, that's crazy talk. It doesn't say it, but that's, that's the essence. Of what it, look, what's he going to do? Go into his mother's womb to be born again? Okay, every woman in the house, I saw them cringe just right now. That, right? I just, there, that, that, that whole thing, it, it is the, he's saying something really ridiculous. You're used to hearing it, so now you don't think it's so ridiculous anymore for him to say, but I want you to think about what it was like the first time he said it, how ridiculous it actually sounded. Wait, were you telling me, like, what, I've got to go, go be born again? Uh, well, yeah but not like you think. It's, it's a big deal. So it sounds impossible, and one might say that it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Amen. But what Jesus does reply, in essence, is you're making my point. You're supposed to be the spiritual leader of Israel, and yet you are so carnally minded that you cannot see or understand what the kingdom of God is actually about, nor can you, could you enter in to why I came. Now, I want you to think like what was about the, the time and the situation in which Jesus is speaking. We've talked about this a number of times where there is a, a great political you know, uh, struggle going on. There is military you know, kind of military battle going on. Uh, there is a lot of stress. There's a lot of tension there. People are uh, disgusted with one another. Even within Judaism, there's a great deal of factions in, in that. Uh, the difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, but also uh, the Zelotes and their expectations and the things that, that they are believing about how things are supposed to unfold. But there is a great messianic tension, if you will, Something's got to happen. Something's got to give. Ever felt like that? 
Something's going to happen. Something's got to give. They're, they're, and, and, and so it's just it's bubbling over, right? If it, was a, if it was the kettle on the stove, like all the good stuff would be flowing over the top because you, you, I mean, everything is foaming up. And, and it is in that environment where the expectation of Messiah is heavily driven by this idea We need to get rid of the Romans. They've come into our land. They're oppressing us in our land. And nothing will do until we've conquered them. And not just conquered them, but really crushed them because of what they've done to us. And and here's the other part is that it's easy to forget Before Rome, it was Greece. Before Greece, it was the Medes and the Persians. Before them, it was just the Persians. Before them, it was the Babylonians. Uh, Before that, I mean, like, you've been oppressed a long time. There's this point in in which, and you're looking at things in the Scripture, and you're just like, hey, when does the the deliverance come? When does this stuff happen? Uh, We really want to see these people crushed, and every time someone gets crushed, somebody else seems to take their place, and they're ready for some vengeance. And so in essence, what he's saying is, see, my kingdom is not about the nation state, and it's not about beating down the Romans, and it's not about all these earthly things, but I've come to bring a a kingdom-oriented life. And the goal is not to defeat your neighbors, but to defeat your real enemies, sin and death. And the real motive for my coming is not vengeance. Because if you're Israel, what you want in that moment is vengeance. You want to crush your enemies. You want to get your pound of flesh. And Jesus says just the most inconceivable thing. He says, I don't hate your neighbors. I don't hate the world. You know, sometimes when you and I quote that passage, for God so loved the world, It's one thing when we're talking to the person right in front of us that we like or want to interact with and we want them to get saved. It's a whole other thing when we step back and look at the world at large to say that God loves all of that. Huh. See, here's what I know is that just like the Jews, there are moments where... where my thought is that, but you're going about how he's going to deal with those who have dealt harshly or cruelly or unkindly with me. And I kind of miss the passage where I'm really ready to hand that out in a way that like gets people saved, you know, and, and things like that. But, but I don't have the perspective. Can you imagine what that sounded like? to Nicodemus in that moment? You have no idea what my kingdom's actually about. First of all, the motive for my coming isn't to get even. The motive for my coming isn't to squash your enemies. My motive for coming isn't any of the things you think. The real motive for my coming was this, that God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that God, the God of the Old Testament, That God loves the entire world, not just the Jews. And he loved that world so much that he gave this amazing peace offering of his very own son.
That's why when you and I, like, we look at these Christmas images of the babe in the manger and the, the manger scene and all that kind of stuff, that's why it's captivating, right? That's why we love those passages when it talks about peace on earth, goodwill to men, you know, and things like that. We, we revel in that because there is this the tenderness, there is the vulnerability of that, that God would send His Son. And that's, if that doesn't capture your heart, if it doesn't make you tender to who God is, like, that's worrisome, isn't it? It should, it does captivate our hearts with a sense of tenderness. And that's, that's what he's speaking to. It's not like you think, it's like this. God loves the entire world. That's why he would send his son and, and send him in such a, a vulnerable way. It's, it's why God would do the things he's doing through me for the nations, not just for the chosen, but for all. In that little kingdom, we have both the kingdom of God and the love of God being presented in a, as the very mission, the very core of what Christmas is all about. It's why Jesus came. It's the impetus of Advent. Jesus came to give us new life. What kind of new life? A life where you and I are under and submitted to and a part of the kingdom of God for the sake of the world that God loved and to set us free from the real overlords, the real enemies, sin and death. Do you know, one of the things that changed my whole attitude about how I read the Old Testament was the day that this, this sunk into me right here. That the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that God was the one who sent his son. And so it occurred to me that if I wasn't reading the Old Testament in light of that text right there, then I was reading it wrong. I just needed to go back and rethink. Clearly, I was letting tradition, my own hang-ups, maybe issues with my parents or something else, or maybe some religious baggage or whatever else, but the promise right there that spoke into the whole thing was, that's the God The very God that they thought wanted to crush the world, was that was the God who sent His Son. There was no difference in mission or interaction with the world around them. And then Jesus addresses the reason why Nicodemus and others could not see, hear, or understand the message. They were worried, they were consumed with many things but those things were not of kingdom concern. Instead, they were consumed with position, they were consumed with power, they were consumed with winning, they were consumed with defeating, they were consumed with revenge, they were consumed about being right. Have any of those things ever taken your heart captive? Have you ever gone to the Bible looking for the text that would justify you rather than correct you? <laughs> Find the thing that you're looking for to justify your feelings, your response. I am captivated by this thought that Israel was called the chosen, which was a commission to be a royal priesthood to the nations. Do you know what priesthood means? Priesthood means to stand between someone and God and to intervene for their sake. Israel's invitation was to be a royal priesthood, not to stand in condemn. He didn't call them to be the prophetic voice that condemns. He called them to be a royal priesthood. He called them to be the people who would be the city on a hill, the light to the nations, the hope of the world, not the condemnation of the world. 
And so somehow they, in that process, debased chosen to mean God prefers me over you and I should get special privileges. Do we ever do that as Christians? Do we think sometimes that, that we should be uh, free from certain difficulties, trials, or circumstances because we belong to God? And yet, if you and I look at the testimony of the apostles, like where would we get that idea, right? I mean, you, I just tell me, you know, even John, right? I mean, like John's the only one who doesn't get slaughtered in the, in, in the whole thing. And even when you look at the life of John, you know, as I, the, my stepdad, 96, he has buried four out of five children. All of his military buddies that he tells his awesome stories about jumping out of airplanes with, gone. All. He's the last one. At 96, his siblings are all gone. His, most of his children are gone. Tell me, what's so great about living to be 96 years of age? No one's there to celebrate you. No one's going to tell your stories. I, I think it's part of the, the whole thing that sometimes we get so mixed up because we look around at everything here and it seems so first preeminence. And we think that living a really long time would be a really cool thing instead of going to be with Jesus. I don't know how we get that mixed up, but it's, it's a common misunderstanding, isn't it? And, and I, when I look at that, when I hear him tell those stories, and when I watch the tears run down his face as he talks about those things, I find out that there is a real struggle in living to be 96. So John lived to be in his 90s, the last of the apostles. Tell me again, which one of the apostles got it easy? Which one of the apostles, like, was, you know, got a, a Cadillac for his mom because he prayed it in? Or a yacht? Like, I, I just, I'm sorry, it's just not there. Here's what it is. We sign up to die to ourselves and to live for Christ because it is gain and in that process that the love of God is made manifest in us and other people come to know him through us. And so the whole thing is a signing up for me to just continually die to myself and to live for Christ because like the way that he loved me, I start to love the whole rest of the world. It frames, it reframes the way I interact with everybody. Everybody. So how shocking was it to Nicodemus to hear, listen, it's not about you. See, that's not a new message. It's really not. And his invitation was for him to turn loose of his position and his personal recognition and to pursue the king and his kingdom. Now, the sad thing at the moment was that Nicodemus was not ready to do that, right? But the cool thing was, the cool thing was is that Nicodemus actually did. See, history tells us that Nicodemus was, you know, continued to follow Jesus from afar. And we know just even from the things in the scriptures that he was the one who went and claimed Jesus' body, right? And so he ends up getting a front row seat to the resurrection in, in all these events. He gets to be uh, included in the people who were with Jesus in the resurrection and things like that. History tells us that he not only be, uh, uh, did those things, but he became an open follower of Jesus and a leader in the Christian church. It's really amazing. But it also meant that, that the lead, one of the leader of Israel's people had to humble himself and gain all, just this whole new perspective, right, on why God sent his son. And so as we reflect in this third week of Advent, the motive that drove Jesus' first coming and consequently will drive his second return is that of love. 
And while that's true that his advent was prophesied in the Old Testament, that his death and resurrection liberated us from sin and death, and that he ultimately fulfilled the law and the prophets, here's the thing that you need to know. That isn't why he came. See, God didn't do what he did out of some sense of obligation. Well, you know, I wrote these things down. I didn't see that coming. God didn't do it out of obligation. God didn't do it. You, you actually could earn hell, right? There was no demand of him. So he didn't do it out of obligation, or some kind of external code. Well, the law says. Well, the law says. But guess who knew the beginning from the end, who said he purposed us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the earth was poured? Guess who spoke those promises to Abraham before there was a Torah? See, he didn't have to speak any of those things. He didn't have to do it. God didn't do it because of some external cord, co code. God didn't do it because there was some way in which he was obligated. He did it simply because... God so loved the entire stinking world. Stinking was my emphasis added, if you didn't know that. Just, it's not some other paraphrase or translation. <laughs> and therefore, Advent is the message that God so loved us, that he made a way for us to be abound in his love and to live a kingdom of heaven kind of life. And that, that, my friends is the really good news of Christmas. Let's stand together, shall we? Love, for whatever else Christmas and Christianity are, truth, justice, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, the Son of God, a virgin birth, the fulfillment of the Scriptures, the, the reckoning of the law, and on and on that list could go. But in truth, the ultimate thing that you and I know is the truth, first and foremost, is that God so loved us all, all of us, that He sent His Son. Therefore, my motives as I approach those outside of Christ, if they're going to be remotely right, must also be conceived in that place, to love them, to love my neighbors as myself. As I see people doing Christmas outside of the knowledge of who Jesus is and what he did for us, can I remind us one and all that I should not be offended, irritated, or disappointed in them, but to love them and hope that they would know and, if possible, that I would be the one to introduce them to the love of Christ in that. But my motive, my motive for making Christmas all about Christmas again shouldn't be my contempt for how bad the world has gotten off track, but it should be that recognizing there is a great opportunity for us at Christmas to share the love of God in Christ. Why might you invite your neighbor to candlelight service on Christmas Eve? Well, it won't be to have the biggest attendance or because it's going to be the most amazing service, although I think it will be both of those things. But may it ever be because we love them like God so loved them and sent his son. Can I have the prayer team members go ahead and come on up? Father God, we want to thank you for the love of God in Christ, for the hope of eternal life that comes through Jesus. And we pray that as we enter into this Christmas season, as we're looking forward with anticipation to all the fun and the frivolity that we might never forget, that we might never forget that the primary message is that you so loved us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. We hope Amen. you enjoyed worshiping with us. If you would like more info about any of the ministry opportunities or to stay connected, please visit vinelife.church. If you're watching us on YouTube, stay up to date with us by subscribing and hitting the notification bell. You can also connect to us through Facebook and Instagram. God bless you as you love God, love people, and pass it on. We'll see you next week.